we move to the next uh, speaker next speaker is uh, raj kiran uh, raj kiran is going to talk on managing inflammatory pain condition like rheumatoid arthritis spondyloarthritis raj kiran is a rheumatologist from hyderabad he works in srikara hospital he is a very good organizer raj kiran is a new rising star in the andhra pradesh and telangana rheumatology scene also on the indian rheumatology he is a very good organizer also <laughs> Thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Mahendra Nath sir. Uh, my name is Raj Kiran. Uh, I am going to talk on managing inflammatory pain conditions. So these are the conditions where we have inflammation. It's quite simple. So uh, because this is a symposium on musculoskeletal diseases, I am going to talk on uh, inflammatory conditions which affect joint and bone diseases. so if you look at the inflammatory joint diseases uh, uh, the most common thing which we come across are rheumatoid arthritis spondyloarthropathy and certain connective tissue diseases where we have uh, like pain as a very important uh, problematic issue spondyloarthropathy as a group if you see we have uh, lots of conditions in that they include ankylosing spondylitis psoriatic arthritis ibd related arthritis and undifferentiated spondyloarthropathy so one version is like if you club all these diseases together probably their number could outweigh or their number could be more than rheumatoid arthritis patients in connective tissue disease lupus sjogrens uh, scleroderma mixed connective tissue disease undifferentiated connective tissue disease all of these can present with inflammatory joint pains osteoarthritis sometimes can get inflammatory even though traditionally it is not an inflammatory condition but sometimes you can have intermittent spurts of inflammation in osteoarthritis crystal arthropathy gout is an uh, a significant inflammatory joint disease which necessitates immediate therapy with anti inflammatory drugs so to manage inflammatory pain we need to choose a proper anti inflammatory medications so anti inflammatory medications uh, when we are uh, talking about anti inflammatory medications there is there is an unprovoked inflammation which is going on which is continuing and this is this is uh, what we are talking now is all about a chronic pain so anti inflammatory medication uh, could be symptom modifying or it could be uh, disease modifying it because there is an underlying disease which causes pain so we have certain drugs which reduce the disease in turn reducing the pain and we have certain drugs which just reduce the pain per se might not affecting the natural course of disease so the most common uh, drugs which we use to modify the symptoms in the cases of arthritis include non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs and corticosteroids and we have disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs to control the underlying inflammatory disease so this is uh, the most recent version of classification of disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs which we use to treat the underlying disease which in turn leads into inflammatory pain so dmrs they are broadly classified into synthetic dmrs and biologic dmrs and in synthetic dmrs we have our traditional uh, conventional synthetic dmrs which include methotrexate leflonamide etc and uh, we have a targeted synthetic dmrs which are coming newly which includes uh, jac kinase inhibitors like tofacitinib baricitinib and in biologic dmrs we have a bio originator dmrs and a biologic synthetic dm biologic uh, bio similar dmrs sorry so basically biologic dmrs are large proteins bigger bigger uh, uh, weight uh, molecules or proteins they are synthesized from uh, live organism so they are biologics and whereas uh, synthetic dmrs or targeted synthetic dmrs they are small molecules so once we diagnose rheumatoid arthritis so dr dharmanand has clearly mentioned in his talk how to differentiate between inflammatory pain and non inflammatory pain so inflammatory joint pains we have uh, pain stiffness swelling in the joints and most of the inflammatory joint pains they get worst with rest and they get relieved partially with with movements as dr dharmanand was, was already uh, talking about inflammatory joint pains earlier he said like most of the patients with rheumatoid arthritis they say after overnight 
sleep early morning they get up and they feel slight stiffness in their finger joints and once they start moving by afternoon once once they start working over the day by afternoon they feel uh, slightly better um, so once we make a diagnosis of inflammatory arthritis especially rheumatoid arthritis the order of the day is we need to start with upfront uh, disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs uh, this is how uh, we differentiate between inflammatory and non inflammatory pain which has already been discussed earlier so rheumatoid arthritis uh, like we have these uh, three main composition of drugs which we use to reduce uh, the pain so nsaids we use it for short course initially to begin with because the main course therapy is disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs which might take some time to act so to control the pain initially we take the help of non steroidal drugs and uh, sometimes uh, disease modifying drugs like methotrexate they might take one month or one and a half month or two months to act so meanwhile we need to control the symptoms so uh, a bridge course of corticosteroids are used uh, which uh, can be given in the form of an low dose oral steroids or or uh, intramuscular glucocorticoids or intraarticular glucocorticoids so again nsaids are used in the course of uh, rheumatoid arthritis intermittently in the short courses whenever they get they experience the pain so once rheumatoid arthritis is diagnosed so dmrts are used up front uh, like depending upon the disease activity and depending upon the prognostic factors of the disease single dmr or a combination of dmrts are used once the single dmr or combination dmrts if they are not uh, working appropriately then we up, we move to the next step of adding uh, biologic drugs so ultimately what it has to be done is the inflammatory burden or the disease activity has to be uh, controlled in the diseases uh, which uh, have this inflammatory arthritis as a main cause for pain so it is expected that once the inflammation is coming down the pain also uh, comes down which is related to inflammation but if uh, the pain is not improving uh, despite controlling uh, the inflammation we need to look at other causes of pain uh, like uh, like uh, my earlier speakers were talking about uh, fibromyalgia and neuropathic pain all these things needs to be seen uh, if still we have uh, patient is complaining of pain despite uh, having an adequate control of inflammation so in rheumatoid arthritis nsaids they reduce pain but they doesn't have much impact on disease steroids they reduce pain and there is some data which tells us that steroids if we use in early rheumatoid arthritis and early stages of inflammatory arthritis they can still be disease modifying they can alter the pathway of disease and conventional synthetic dmrts especially methotrexate uh, sulfasalazine leflunomide they, they 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 might not have much impact on reducing the pain but they alter the natural course of disease so hence they again might uh, reduce the pain in future so they have a key role to play in pain reduction in inflammatory arthritis biologics especially anti tnf drugs they significantly improve the pain so the requirement of the nsaids uh, might come down when we initiate anti tnf drugs in patients with rheumatoid arthritis and they are also disease modifying and newer drugs like targeted synthetic drugs uh, um, tofacitinib they also can reduce pain and disease as well so coming to ankylosing spondylitis the story of nsaids is slightly different in ankylosing spondylitis compared to rheumatoid arthritis so there are good number of studies and this uh, editorial uh, from nigel haroon in 2012 has uh, compiled lot of uh, previous data most of the data uh, came from germany from jokum cyper where they have studied the long term nsaids if nsaids are used Uh, for more than one year, for up to two years. At the end of two years, the structural damage happening uh, in the spine has been altered. It has been reduced when we use NSAIDs for long term, especially in the case of uh, uh, ankylosing spondylitis. So this puts NSAIDs as probably a DMR kind of. Uh, it gives a probably a DMR kind of role in ankylosing spondylitis. 
So NSAIDs are painkillers or, uh, or not just simply painkillers when we are uh, giving it in patients with ankylosing spondylitis. So ankylosing spondylitis, it has a role beyond reducing pain itself. So NSAID prescription or long term NSAID prescription in ankylosing spondylitis has an uh, adequate symptom and structure modifying effect. But having said that NSAIDs are not free with adverse effects. So when is, whenever we are choosing uh, to give NSAIDs to our patients, NSAIDs for short term course or long term course, we have to use NSAIDs very much judicially and it is always better to uh, avoid in elderly patients until and unless we do not have any other options and patients with cardiovascular and renal comorbidity, uh, we need to be quite careful when we are uh, using NSAIDs and it is always better to stratify our patients if we are giving them NSAIDs. So those patients with lower gastrointestinal risk and lower cardiovascular risk would be ideal patients in whom we can give non-selective NSAIDs and those patients who have lower cardiovascular risk, lower GI risk but higher cardiovascular risk, there is some data which compared naproxen, endomethacin and ibuprofen which has said that probably naproxen, the short acting non-selective NSAID could be safer in patients who are having a higher cardiovascular risk. But having said that, uh, if the patient is in NYHA class 4, it, no NSAID is safe, better to avoid. So patients with higher gastrointestinal risk and lower cardiovascular risk, it is always better to choose COX-2 inhibitor or a non-selective NSAID with proton pump inhibitor. So it is always, whenever we are planning to give an NSAID prescription, it is always better to keep these things in mind to whom we are giving NSAIDs. So, what about the role of disease modifying anti rheumatic drugs in spondyl arthropathy? So, spondyl arthropathy we categorize into axial disease where the axial skeleton, the shoulder girdle, and the spine and the pelvis are getting involved, and we have a peripheral uh, group uh, where we have the knees and ankles and feet or fingers will get affected. So, as per current data available, conventional synthetic DMRs like methotrexate does not have any role to play in axial. Uh, spondyl arthropathy, but still most of uh, the rheumatologists in India still use uh, sulfasalazine with, with some great benefit and many of them believe uh, uh, like sulfasalazine uh, works in axial spondyl arthropathy probably could be its effects on gut microbiome, we really do not know, but still uh, it is somewhat of used, but the, the data which is available is not really convincing on that. And in peripheral uh, spondyl arthropathy, uh, conventional synthetic DMRs do work and as well as biologics also work very well in peripheral spondyl arthropathy. And lupus, scleroderma, Sjogren's, mixed connective tissue disease, undifferentiated connective tissue disease, all these can cause uh, inflammatory joint symptoms. But whenever we are choosing our therapy to treat arthritis in patients with connective tissue disease, we always need to look at concomitant organs which are getting affected because most of the connective tissue diseases, the, they have systemic inflammation ongoing. It is not just joints and bones which are getting affected. Along with joints, they also have uh, problems with the, the other organs, the kidneys, heart, brain. So these uh, things needs to be kept in mind when we are uh, planning to give uh, therapy for inflammatory joint pains in patients with connective tissue disease. Always we need to check renal and cardiovascular morbidity and uh, most often uh, low dose steroids are used for pain relief in patients with inflammatory joint disease uh, who are having a background of connective tissue disease. And immunosuppressives are chosen in, pa in these patients with uh, the background organ involvement, whichever uh, organ involves depending upon that, uh, suppose say somebody has uh, SLA with renal involvement, then uh, uh, cytotoxic drugs like cyclophosphamide or mycophenolate are chosen and along with that corticosteroids are given. So depending upon the organ involvement, the DMR is chosen and background of steroids will go on. And in gout, this uh, gout has this intermittent acute attacks of pain coming and going with some interictal period during the initial phases. And subsequently, of, after a few years of uncontrolled gout, the pain could be chronic and persistent. So the acute pain in gout is very severe and it necessitates immediate therapy. So acute gout attack can be managed with NSAIDs 
or suppose if there is a concomitant renal insufficiency where we cannot give NSAIDs, corticosteroids, low dose to medium dose can be given or intraarticular corticosteroids can be given. Colchicine uh, is another option to reduce an acute pain. Unlike earlier days, colchicine every 2 hours, 3 hours continuously till the patient develops side effects, that kind of uh, pattern of giving colchicine uh, is not very popular nowadays. Most often we give colchicine thrice a day or twice a day along with uh, an aside of our choice. So most often pain gets relieved in a uh, couple of days. And for recurrent attacks of uh, gout, colchicine is given as prophylaxis for a uh, few months. And suppose if uh, somebody is uh, not on any urate lowering therapy initially and if he gets first attack of gout, it is always better not to initiate urate lowering therapy initially. But having said that, if somebody is already on certain dose of urate lowering therapy and if he gets an acute attack, it is always better to maintain that same uh, urate lowering drug whatever he is on without disturbing it and give therapy for acute gout. So the reason behind it is, it is not exactly the uric acid level which will create the problem. It is a fluctuation in uric acid level which is more determinant in causing acute attacks of gout. So to conclude, it is always better to identify like as Dr. Hirachand was telling, the etiology of underlying disease is key to manage the inflammatory pain. Whenever you suspect it is an inflammatory, chronic inflammatory pain, it is always better to diagnose and look for underlying disease and we need to treat with appropriate disease modifying drugs and short course of pain relief, pain relieving drugs like steroids or NSAIDs can be used for symptomatic relief. As uh, Dr. Mahendranath in, in his initial introduction of mine was repeatedly telling like he is a better organizer, better organizer. So to take that forward, I am organizing South Zone IRA conference uh, in May 19 uh, to uh, 21st in Hyderabad, Telangana. So it is a uh, two and a half day conference. So it is entirely uh, a rheumatology uh, 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 thing. and. There, there are also some basic topics uh, of rheumatology and also high-end complicated rheumatology topics. We are trying to incorporate uh, almost all these things in this uh, conference. Uh, so those who are uh, interested, you can write to this zerocon2017 at gmail.com. I thank you uh, ladies and gentlemen for your patient hearing. It is an excellent sir, intraarticular steroid uh, could not only be a pain relieving, it also could be as I said, it could be disease modifying, it might completely uh, knock away the inflammation there sometimes. So the pain might not reoccur or inflammation might completely subside. I think it is one of the excellent way to use steroids because without having much of uh, systemic uh, side effects of corticosteroids, it is one of the best way to use steroids in patients with inflammatory joint disease. And you said uh, the data does not show that sulfasalazine and other drugs have no basis in the management of axial spondyloarthritis. Even the person's data, Jogrenbaum and uh, M.A. Khan, everybody in the last 40, 50 years before the evolution of biologics used sulfasalazine. And we have been using it. I use, Dharmar use, Chandrasekhar use, you use, everybody uses. If you mean, we have used this uselessly, it does not have any existing at all. Sir, uh, what I think is because even the recent ASAS guidelines or most of the data, there is no clear cut data to say convincing data or probably it might not be very well studied. Uh, we do not have any strong data to support sulfur salazine use in uh, axial spondyl arthropathy. But having said that, when I, I asked uh, uh, Jokam Saipar, who was uh, one of the members for ASAS, uh, same question. He said probably sulfasalazine, most of these patients with spondyl arthropathy might have some silent gut inflammation and sulfasalazine might have a role to play in altering gut mi microbiome. Probably that could help. Uh, but having said that, there is no very clear concrete data to support that sulfasalazine vis a vis works very well in actual spondyl arthropathy and most of us most of us in india we use sulfasalazine
Shadrashik. I think, uh, not to confuse the audience actually, I mean, uh, see, there is a little controversy in usage of sulfasalazine when it comes to the axial spondyl arthropathy uh, as a disease modifier. The problem in this assessment is the uh, way we try to assess the ankylosing spondylitis in axial spondyl arthropathy using the ASAS criteria and those follow. I think if you recollect the measures what I was talking about, they are not a good measures which shows an adequate changes and other things are not well captured what a surface analysis does. As a result of which there is a large gap between the experience with surface analysis and its evidence that are available. Second biggest challenge with the, uh, the any clinical trials with surface analysis is it is already a drug off patent and there are no strong clinical trials has been organized keeping the recent recommendations of measures. All that has been done with the old previous measures rather than the new measures. So as a result of which, even if we hunt for a evidence, we are less likely to get it. So now we need to believe with what the experience, experience. that all of us have. I do use sarcosalazine and axils for the arthropathies. We do find patients to be significantly improving with reference to the symptoms. Most critical of it, which what ASAs don't take up is the stay away from the analgesics. Most of our surface allergy patients, by the end of second or third month, stops using analgesics. He almost yes. discontinues analgesics. If you take that as a measure, probably we will be able to prove that yes, surface allergy works, keeping the patient away from analgesics. The advantage, if you look, the renal adverse event and the gastrointestinal adverse event of surface allergy versus NSAIDs, NSAIDs rates five times higher than sulfasalazine. We prefer to use sulfasalazine, which may probably have some disease modifying effect uh, to be little more better and advantageous even compared to the other seconds. We, we as the users of sulfasalazine during last 50 years have failed to produce enough evidence, though it's a good drug, so we should not blame the drug. <laughs> And I think, I think uh, like evidence might come uh, one day or other day. What I feel is lack of evidence doesn't mean lack of efficacy because we have good experience. Even I use sulfa salicin and well, I, I have the same experience that requirement for NSAIDs significantly come down after two months or three months of use of sulfa salicin. But the recommendations doesn't uh, say to use sulfa salicin. We all use. Thank you. Thank you. We move to the next. Uh,